Well, it's a snowy day. I don't know really who to blame for it. So when you get the scriptures out and you start reading the scriptures, you realize that the Bible talks quite a bit about snow. As a matter of fact, in Job, it says in chapter 37, verse 6, God says to the snow, fall on the earth and to the rain, shower, be a mighty downpour. Wow. Job 38, 22. Have you entered the storehouses of snow? I'd like to see that. Or seen the storehouses of hail? That'd be fascinating. Psalm, David writes it this way, Psalm 51. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now, how many of you like to have ice in your drink or you like slushies? Raise your hand if you, if you do. Look, look, keep them up, keep them up. You like some ice in your... Yeah, uh, this is cool. Some of you like, like... Well, the first slushie, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 13. Did you know that? Here it is. Like a snow-cooled drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger. I mean, you're out there at harvest time and you're just wiping your brow, you're sweating. Man, I'm telling you what, it's like going to Turkey Hill, isn't it? And Sherry, what are you saying? It's going over and picking up a drink, yeah. All right, what about Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18? Come now and let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The scripture talks about snow in a lot of different places, and our passage today is going to be talking a little bit about snow. And so as we look at this passage, I want to keep several things in mind. Now, I've talked to you about can we trust God? Can God be trusted? Can God be trusted with your life? That's a question we're asking today. Your life, not the person sitting beside you. Yours. Can God be trusted with your life? Can you trust him? Can you really? To really know what's going on and really know how to lead you and really know how to get you where you need to go, can you really trust God? Now, when God wants to get us from this place to the preferred destiny, that is, the next season where he is leading us, when he wants to get us there, he's going to take us from over someplace else to this place, so we'll do in this season what he wants us to do. We'll be in this season who he wants us to be. We'll accomplish things that are right for him. He'll lead us on to another season later. But when he leads us from over there to over here, there are several things that happen. In the human experience, in just the fleshly experience, we're going to have some aches and pains from time to time. We're going to sweat when it's hot. We're going to be cold when it's cold. We're going to have these different seasons of our life. That's just called the human event, the human experience. But sometimes to get us from here to over there are going to be challenges of preparation, not just the human experience. And so the challenge of preparation might be schooling, it might be life experience, it might be something that's going to help us to be able to come over here where God wants us ultimately to be, to do whatever God wants us to do. You say, Kev, you sound like a one-string guitar, you're saying the same thing every week. I hope you're getting it. In our passage, we're reading about a guy who is an incredible person. His name is Benaiah. He is a person who will eventually become an elite soldier. He is a wonderful fellow with many heroic deeds. His experiences won't be yours. His experiences are a bit more bloody and gory than most of us would ever experience. But we want to look at his life because for God to get him from where he was and where he wanted him to be, he was going to have to take him through some things, and they were going to be challenging things. They were not always going to be easy. There were going to be moments when he would have the opportunity to say, time out, enough is enough. God, I didn't sign up for that. I don't like, I'm not sure about this. There would be opportunities where he could turn right or he could turn left, and he could get away from whatever it was that was coming up to his life. What would he do? How would he respond? 
I want to look at three lessons that come out of this passage today, and I want to consider them as they teach us how to advance through these situations of our life to get to the place where God wants us to be, to bless us in ways that we didn't know we could be blessed, to do things for us we didn't know, and for us to do things for Him. And it may not always feel good, and it may not always be that we get the accolades and the bright lights of everything, but it's doing His will. It's finding out what He has in mind. First thing I want to say to you, if you're ready to receive it, say yes. We will encounter challenges on the path on God's path to the plan that he has for us. He's going to face some challenges. They're going to be there. It was a snowy day when Benaiah was out. And you think over in that part of the world, they're not going to have a lot of snow. But whatever was going on, on this day they had some snow. And on this day when he saw the snow, wow, look at this. He goes out to do some stuff. I don't know what stuff he was doing. But he was going to go out and he was going to be busy about his life. And so he's out about his life and he meets up with a lion. I don't know how big it was. Let's just say it's 500 pounds. It's a pretty big one. It is a big lion. And he meets up with this lion on this day when it's snowy. So it's a snowy day and he meets up with this big lion. Now, what would you do whenever you face a situation? What would you do whenever you face a lion that you see ahead of you? What is going to be your natural response and your natural inclination to do with that? The other day I was looking at some of the news online and I looked at one place and it showed five big mountain lions that were walking through a yard. I could just imagine in that neighborhood there aren't very many cats, rabbits, or dogs running around. (laughs) And I didn't see any people in the picture either. Five big cats. 500 pound lion. What would you have done whenever you, you know what he did? He decided he'd chase it. And who would have thought of that? I saw a documentary yesterday. A lady said that she, she saw a wolf come onto her, her um, path. And um, no, it was a coyote. A coyote that had come onto her path. And, and it ended up attacking her and nearly killed her. And it was rabid. They found it later. Nearly killed this woman. And she talked about how vicious it was and how mean it was. She said, I tried to make myself bigger. She was a little lady. I tried to make myself look bigger, but it didn't work. We might want to make ourselves look big, but it takes off running after this thing, and it takes off running from him. Oh, my stars. Now, it's a snowy day. On a normal day, this lion might have good footing, might have everything else. We're not sure exactly how it happened, but we know that when he came up to the pit to a cistern, that this thing, it, it doesn't stop like it should. It may have been looking over his shoulder. It may have slid in the snow. I don't know, but it fell down into the pit. So this lion is now down in the pit. Wow. This guy has an incredible heart about him. He encountered a challenge on the path. Now, one outline says it this way. Benaiah met the worst of enemies, a lion. Benaiah met the worst possible place in a pit. Benaiah met under the worst possible conditions on a snowy day. We would say we're at the wrong place at the wrong time, but really he was at the right place at the right time and God's plan was all over him because in this moment, God knew exactly what he was up to. God wanted to take this guy from over here to get him over there. God had extraordinary things in mind for him. Now he had grown up in the house of a priest. You would think he might become a priest, but God has something else very different in mind for him. And he wants him to follow after his plan, and that's what he's doing here. Another lesson I think the passage teaches is this. We will make decisions that will impact God's plan for us. You and I are going to make decisions that will impact God's plan for us. The decisions we make today make a difference in where we go in our destiny and in our future. The decisions we make today, we can manage, and we can live with the results of them. Because you know that you reap what you sow and you reap it later than you sowed, more than you sow, and you reap what you sow. And I wanted to reap good stuff, and I've been able to do that. Benaiah looked at this lion. He decided to chase him. He goes to the edge of the pit. Now, when he's at the edge of the pit and the lion's down in the pit, if we're sitting in the bleachers, if we're sitting up in the audience here, and we're looking at this happen as if it were in an arena ahead of us, we would say, don't jump, stop! But not him. Nope. Not him. If you told him the stove was hot, he probably would touch it. If you told him don't drive fast, he probably would not drive slow. 
But really the real life story here is this. This guy had an incredible warrior heart. He's an incredible soldier. He is an incredible fellow who has been bred for this stuff. He was raised in a pastor's house. He was raised as a priest's son, but he doesn't have that calling on his life. He's called by God to be a mighty warrior, and his dad might not know how to teach him that, except, son, you got to face whatever comes your way and deal with it. And so he says, okay, this has come my way. I'm going to deal with this sucker. And that's exactly what he's doing. We'd say, leave well enough alone, you're safe. The lion's down in a pit, but you don't know Benaiah. He goes right down into this pit where this lion is. <clears throat> you may be today facing a situation that is challenging to you. And it may be calling your number. And it may be ringing your bell. It may just be human event stuff. But it might be... the present assignment on your way to God's plan for your life. Now you could get there and say, well, the lion fell in a pit. I'm going to just turn away. Whew, close call. You could do that. You could get angry at God and say, God, I don't understand this. I wasn't up to this. I didn't sign up for this. I don't live for this kind of stuff. God, what are you up to? I don't like this. And you could fret and be fussed at God. You could get real situation and finally say, okay, I tend to land on number two. I land at number two, get frustrated at God first. And then I get a reality check and I say, okay, well, I got to deal with it. So then I start dealing with it. And then I say, well, I got to deal with it. So I start trusting God to help me understand what to do. And he helps. But I didn't listen to us and he jumped down into the pit. First Chronicles chapter 11 and 22 <clears throat> parallels it this way. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, valiant fighter of Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. And I checked to see what that meant. The Hebrew understands it this way. He struck down the two mightiest warriors, not just two mightiest, the two mightiest warriors is what I understand it to say. And it continues on. He went down into a pit on a snowy day and he killed a lion. He operated no reserves, no regrets, no retreat. This problem would be dealt with. What about your marriage? What about your wayward child? Teen, how are you treating your parents? Are you a rebel? Or are you getting along with them? How are you dealing with your life? What's going on with the situation of life you've been faced with? I want to look at a third lesson that I think the passage teaches us, and that is this. We will come to realize the early challenges prepared us for God's plan. The early challenges prepared us for God's plan. Other people have encountered lions. Did you ever think of that? Think about it just for a second. King David, King David was a young guy out tending the sheep and he sees a lion. You know what he does? He deals with it. Didn't run from it. Your Bible tells you that he killed the lion that was before him. Saved his flock. Pretty incredible. What about Daniel? Daniel was thrown into a pit with a lion. Guess what happens to Daniel? He continues to trust God and in his case on this day, He's able to make it through and he doesn't get eaten by the lions. The lion experience wasn't the end all. They didn't go on speaking tours and write books and do seminars. They realized it was on the way to something God had in mind for them. Get a load of this. David, when he faces Goliath, guess what he thinks back to? Well, I did kill a lion and I did kill a bear. I can get this guy in the name of the Lord. He's down. You see that? Daniel goes into the lion's den and comes out. O king, live forever. The king turns his heart toward the God of Daniel and says, wow, we're going to worship. Get him out. He makes him second in command. He just has instantaneous, extraordinary catapulting to the front of the line where God had in mind for him to be all along. I just want to say to you today, 
that when Benaiah saw this lion, he goes after this lion and he takes care of this lion. And we don't get all fussed about things that are like small time problems we have because we have to do this test because you have to get this degree to do that job. If you're getting too fussed up over the test, you need to take a deep breath, take a walk, read the lesson and realize I'm taking the stinking test. It's what I must do. It's my job. It's my assignment. I have to do this and get over yourself because it's what you do next. It's just what you have to do. Now, if we wanted to go overly heightened today and we had no motored vehicle at all, no bicycle, we had to walk, and you could swim, we would have to take off in a walk and whoo, we'd go over a few hills and say, whoo, man, we'd come down by the theater to drive in and we'd go on 248 and we'd go over there by the 248 uh, little shack, coffee shack. Oh, we'd wave at him. We'd walk by the pig farm and hold our nose and we'd keep going on down a little ways. Pretty soon we're coming down and saying, man, this is getting better. We see that big mountain and we think, oh no, shoot. <laughs> You're going to either go around that mountain or over that mountain. We choose to take the path, right? And we think, whoo, ha, faced all those hills and now this mountain and I beat it. Now you're walking through and you come to the other side and you look over there and I'll be, there's a river. Guess what? You don't have a boat, no motorboat. You're going to have to cross the river. You're going to have to swim across. And you look back in your rear view mirror after you come out the other side of that river and say, guess what? I've gone over a lot of hills and I had to take care of that mountain. And I got to take care of that river. I'm not quite where I want to be, but I'm on my way. You see, all those things are preparation things that you're doing along the way to prepare you to do what you're supposed to do once you get into Lehighton. And God has his way of helping us get along where he wants us to go to be able to be who he wants us to be when we get where we want to go. These challenges may seem small and annoying, but they may be the gateway to something big. In Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10, it reminds us, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise the small beginnings. I was on the phone last night with my mother. We were FaceTiming, really. And uh, I'm putting together this big, long puzzle, and I wanted her to see it because she likes to put the puzzle together. So she walked in the other room. Here, let me show you one we just put together today. She takes me in, shows me this farm thing. It was cool, and we talked for a while. My mom's conversations are pretty short usually. She said, she said, you remember whenever, I'm paraphrasing, you remember whenever you used to go down to Elder, Missouri, and there were just two ladies at that church, and you went there and you preached anyway, and sometimes only one would show up. You remember when you were faithful in that little something? I was just telling somebody the other day, you'd be faithful in little thing, God make you in charge of bigger things. Go ahead and take care of the lion. Go ahead and take care of everything. Because God knows what he's up to. Don't ignore it. Deal with it. But I absolutely annihilated that lion. David was promoted to be king. Daniel was second in line. And one day, David is needing somebody to come alongside and be one of his mighty men. If you read the scripture about David's mighty warriors, they are absolutely, unbelievably incredible. They could be on any military team in the world today. They are absolutely beyond the pale. They are incredible. And Benaiah went in and he wiped out two of the mightiest warriors of Moab. And being a soldier and being a very, very good warrior. The scripture also says in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 and verse 23 that he faced a giant that was seven and a half feet tall. That's a little bit taller than most of us. Some of you are a pretty good size, but it's a little taller than any of us. He was facing this seven and a half foot tall giant. And as he faced him, the guy has a spear. And the guy is a warrior himself. And so he faces this guy. How are you going to face this guy? He only has a club with him. Now, it pays to be a member of the right club. I don't know what club he had with him, but he had a club in his hand. And he went up against this giant. And your scripture says that he absolutely annihilated this guy and killed him with his own spear. Mm. That's taking care of business. In a big time way. But God wanted to get him over here. And later on, 
he wasn't just going to work for David. He was going to work for King Solomon also. And one day King Solomon said, I need you to go find so-and-so and take care of him. He said, done. Read your Bible. He takes out to take care of, it's really one of David's sons. He goes over to take care of him and he says, calls him out. First, he doesn't want to come out. He goes and takes care of business and he was all done. Came back, deed done, thanks, next. Wow. Batterson in his book does a great job of writing, and you've read it, and he talks about this. And to get over here where God wants you to be, King David is looking through resumes, and he's trying to find somebody to fill this role. And Batterson starts out, I can't think of too many places I'd rather not be than in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. Can you? Getting stuck in a pit with a lion on a snowy day isn't on anybody's wish list. It's a death wish. Death wish. But you've got to admit something. I killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. It looked pretty impressive on your resume if you're applying for bodyguard with the king of Israel. Unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? I can picture David flipping through a stack of resumes. Have you done that? I've done that. You flip through a stack of resumes. One says, I majored in security at the University of Jerusalem. Nope. I did an internship at the Palace Guard. Nada. I worked for Brinks Armored Chariots. Thanks, but no thanks. Then David comes to the next resume. I killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. He didn't even check the references. He doesn't even check the references. This is the kind of person you want in charge of the bodyguard. Lion chasers make great bouncers. <laughs> I'll zoom out and look at the story through the wide angle lens, he writes. Most people would have seen a 500 pound problem, but not Beniah. But most people finding yourself in a pit with a lion on a snowy day would qualify as bad luck. But you can see how God turned this that looked to be a bad break into a big break. And Maniah lands a job interview with the king of Israel. Check this out. David grew up in a very devout home. Maniah grew up in a very devout home. David killed a lion. He killed a lion. You see the parallels that are starting to happen here? David faced a giant. He faced a giant. David said, who could be in this place with me? Well, guess what? I want that guy over here. He, he's, he, he is my kind of guy. He's God's kind of guy. That's the kind of person that I want coming around me. This person, just come on in here and be, be my mighty man. And he came right in and he became a mighty man. Now, let me just say this. I don't know where you are and what's going on exactly in your life right now, but I have a feeling God knows. I just have that feeling that God knows where you are right now. He's got your number. He's got your name. He's not surprised by anything. He knows what's up. And right now you might grouse a little bit, but eventually come to the reality, I've got to deal with this. And so dealing with it, you've got to go around the mountain and across the river to get where God wants you to go. And you can, you can make it. With God, all things are possible. I'm talking to myself. I'm just letting you listen in today. With God, all things are possible. You can do it, Kev. You can do it. We have to do it. What's the alternative? We must do it. Because we want to follow after God. Can God be trusted with your life? I was listening to Focus on the Family this week. I don't know who the person was talking. It was a lady. Someone told me afterwards that it probably was this person, but I'm sorry, I don't know if it was or not, so I won't say. But a lady was talking. She was telling her story. Her husband had cheated on her royally, and she was brokenhearted and thought maybe they were getting things worked out eventually, and it ended up, nope, after all, he was not. He cheated on her again, and so their marriage dissolved. She decided she would put together a list of things that she wouldn't do otherwise but needed to be done, and she just thought, I'm just going to go ahead and make this list of stuff, and I'm going to do it. And so she put her list together, and in putting together her list of things, she decided she would go get a health checkup, a full checkup. She would have exams she wouldn't have had otherwise, wouldn't even have thought to have. And she goes in and she gets this exam, and they say to her, ma'am, you've got breast cancer. She says, oh, boy. Now, at first, she said, some of my friends were saying to me, good grief. 
You've got breast cancer after you've just gone through hell. That's sadistic. She said, no, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have gone through this test that taught me that I had this so I could take care of this, and now I'm still alive for my kids. I want to ask you a couple of questions. What if your situation is not about your lion at all, but is about what lies on the other side of the lion? Just a thought. And how do you see your lion challenge today? Patterson writes this. God is into building resume, your resume. He always uses past experiences to prepare us for future opportunities. Those God-given opportunities may come disguised as man-eating lions. And now, Father, on this snowy day in 2020, we face various kinds of lions. Your word has taught us today that you can help us through the situations that appear impenetrable and overwhelming. Lord, we agree that the best answer is to trust in you. So I pray that some way, somehow, you would help each one of us to lay aside anything that would keep us from trusting you, that we might trust you fully. In Jesus' name, amen.